Man, do we have a lot to celebrate today. How about that uh, football game win last night? Come on, yesterday. There you go. It's about time. That's a long time coming. And then I know, uh, just honoring our diversity, I know that yesterday was Nigerian Independence Day. Come on, I know we got some Nigerians in the place. There you go. That's wonderful. I love that. And then I just before we dive into the message, I just want to let you know is we, we talked about Kingdom Builders a few weeks ago and just talked about like how there's different areas to that, local, global projects, local, global partnerships. And one of the things that we do in our community because of your continued generosity through our Kingdom Builders, our tithes and our offerings, is we help host an expungement seminar every single year. And this year, you can see the dates on the screen. It's going to be in February, on February the 18th. That will be here in our building. We'll have about 100 lawyers who are here, four to five judges who volunteer their time throughout the day. We help people who have felonies on their, their record. We help them, if they meet certain requirements, either expunge the felonies or seal them. Or if neither of those are two options, we have a room of hope where you can get legal counsel for free, help you determine your next steps. There's a lot of pre-work that has to be done. You can see uh, the different information there, the phone number, the place to email, and uh, you can scan the QR code if you want, and it'll help get you there. And that will be happening in February, but the deadline is coming up in October. So if you know anybody that's you or you know anyone, uh, get that information out. And I, I'll be honest with you, it's one of the best things that we do. We will have probably usually around seven to 800 people go through in a day, and they come from all over. It's just a tremendous, a great way for us to be the church. If you have your Bibles, I want you to join me or your devices. I want you to join me in Matthew chapter 4, verse 23 is where we'll be in a few moments. But I had something happen to me a couple of years ago that um, should not have happened. It was late at night. My wife and, and my kids and I were leaving a wonderful place called Holiday World. Come on, somebody. We were hungry. And rather than pay all the money to eat there, we said, man, we're going to eat at a restaurant on the way afterwards. And the only thing open that late was the great restaurant called Taco Bell. I can remember waiting in line to eat at Taco Bell, just dreaming and thinking about what I was going to partake of. We go to order, and we are told, you can order what you want, but we just thought we'd want to let you know that we don't have any tortilla shells. And I said, well, come again, please. Uh, and what do you mean by that? Well, we don't got no tacos, shells. We don't got no burrito shells. We don't got anything like that. So let me get this straight. You're Taco Bell with no tortillas. And they said, that's right. And I was like, oh, man. So we had to leave and, and eat at a gas station, I think. But I thought, man, how interesting that they could be missing an ingredient that was critical to their mission. And the same thing happened a few years before that. I don't know why it keeps happening to me. I'm in Kentucky Fried Chicken. I'm in line. I'm waiting in the line. Come on, somebody. I get up to order. They say, sir, we just need to let you know. Order what you want, but we don't have any chicken. I mean, that's a bad day right there. When Kentucky Fried Chicken running out of chicken. Can I get an amen, somebody? Help brother. How many of you just want to close the sermon now? Let's go eat, partake. Yeah. You know, I, I, this has a point, I promise. I can find a, a, a sermon illustration in anything. But that, those two stories popped into my mind during the yearly Bible reading when I was a few months ago was reading Matthew chapter 4. And you're going to see uh, three ingredients that were essential to Jesus' life and ministry. It says, this is what Matthew says. And Jesus went about all of Galilee teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. 
three ingredients to Jesus' ministry. He was teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and he was healing all manner of sickness and diseases among the people, preaching, teaching, and healing. That verse stood out to me, and I wrote it in my journal. And I put two or three words next to these preaching, teaching, and healing. First, I said preaching to me, that's inspirational. The word moves us in creative ways. The worship moves us. It's, it's, it's inspirational. Teaching, Jesus, I wrote here, instruction, line upon line, precept upon precept, principles and wisdom to be applied, instruction. And then healing, I wrote next to that the word impossible. Just thinking these three essential ingredients to Jesus' ministry. Apostle Paul, just began to think, the Apostle Paul in Romans 15 echoes Jesus' three ingredients. He says these words. He's closing his letter. He says, I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I, here it is, I have said and done by the power of signs and wonders through the power of the Spirit of God. Again, I find there the preaching. He says, by what I've said teaching by what I've done, healing by the powers of signs and wonders through the power of the Holy Spirit. A more popular verse would be Paul says to the Corinthians, I did not come to you with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. Wisdom would be instruction, persuasion would be inspiration, demonstration of the Spirit's power would be the impossible. And here's what I, where I want to, the title of the sermon, two-thirds is not enough, is often we will focus on the first two, inspiration and instruction, and we will leave out the third one, impossible. And I thought about that, is we want to be a church that has all three, not just two. It's possible in a Western mindset, in a Western expression of church, to build great churches upon inspirational preaching and worship. There's a lot of inspiration, a lot of things moving, but you wonder at the end, what did they really say? Come on. And then you have some that there's a whole lot of teaching and a whole lot of like word there, but man, let's be honest, not very inspiring sometimes. And some can function on both. And some, I would say, can focus on, hey, we're just going to be the church of the impossible and we're not going to teach some stuff, and we're not going to be inspiring. I think if we're going to model our ministry and our Christian experience around the life and ministry of Jesus in our church, then we have to include all three. We want to have instruction, we want to have inspiration, and we want to have impossible. For the next few weeks, I'm going to speak to you on the last one. I want to speak to you about a church that makes room for impossibilities. And what I love about Paul is he marries this thought of impossibility to the person of the Holy Spirit. He says, it was through the power of the Holy Spirit that I performed signs and wonders. So we will define for this series the word impossible like this. Impossible happens when we partner with the Holy Spirit to fulfill the Great Commission. And that's important because God will always empower those who are about His mission. The Great Commission, for those of you who maybe never heard that, is Matthew 28. He says, therefore, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. That is an impossible mission that God gave to the disciples, and it's an impossible mandate that God has placed upon you and upon Stone Creek Church. That should cause us to be in partnership and fellowship and dependent upon the person of the Holy Spirit. So for the next five to six weeks, I'm going to speak to you about one person, the person of the Holy Spirit. I just want to say a few things. I know that brings up for some a lot of baggage, a lot of junk sometimes. I just want you to know that uh, the Holy Spirit 
is not a, as a person to be experienced and not debated. The Holy Spirit is a person to be experienced and not debated. Now, I'll say every week, I'll give some theological frameworks for us, some teaching here around the person of the Holy Spirit. He is a part of the Godhead. The God of Christianity is expressed in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. There is no hierarchy within the Godhead. It is not God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit down here. Sometimes, unintentionally, that's not what we would say, but we can live that way. It's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. When it comes to their divine attributes, they are completely equal. It's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All eternal, all powerful, all knowing when it comes to their divine attributes. Now, I'll say this too. How does the, the Trinity play together? How does the parts of the Godhead work together? There's a few ways that I, I see that. And these are just ways to help us understand it. First is this. God plans it. Jesus pays for it. And the Holy Spirit presents it. That's a simple way to see the Godhead working together. God planned it. Jesus pays for it. And then the Holy Spirit presents it to you. And the next one I'd say is this. You could look at it this way. Uh, without God the Father, we have no one to pray to. Without God the Son, we have no way to pray. And without God the Holy Spirit, we have no desire to pray. Let me say it like this. Without God the Father, you have no one to pray to. Without God the Son, you have no way to pray. And without God the Holy Spirit, you have no desire to pray. So, I want to just break down a few things. And I'm trying to debunk and demystify the person of the Holy Spirit for many of us. Two things I want to say before we jump into some teaching. First is this. Jesus totally depended upon the person of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was completely dependent upon the person of the Holy Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit who came upon Mary and allowed Jesus to be birthed through her womb. It says the Holy Spirit hovered over her. And then when Jesus was born, he performed no earthly miracles until his baptism. When he comes out of the water, the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove descends upon him. There was no miracles until the Holy Spirit immersed himself upon the life of Jesus. It was not Jesus' deity that allowed him to perform his miracles. It was his dependence upon the person of the Holy Spirit because it says the Holy Spirit was in Jesus, upon Jesus, and worked through Jesus. And then it says this, even at the end, after he's died, the Bible says he was buried three days and resurrected by the power of the Holy Spirit. So, emulating the life of Jesus, who was completely dependent upon the person of the Holy Spirit, come on, you and I should do likewise. And then here's the second thought that we have to understand, is you must totally depend upon the Holy Spirit to live out the Christian life. You must totally depend upon the Holy Spirit to live out this thing we call the Christian life. You see, the danger of this is that, especially those of us who are more of a Pentecostal persuasion or you come from a Pentecostal background, is this, is that you can make the Holy Spirit an event and only experience him and relate to him in event-like terms. But when Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit and the Apostle Paul talk about the Holy Spirit, they do so in relational terms. Apostle Paul, when he ends this magnificent letter, First and Second Corinthians, his final words at the end of Second Corinthians, he says, and now may the love of the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen. What, what a great way to end his letter, the Trinity on display. That word fellowship is the Greek word koinonia. It means to be in joint collaboration with, a deep fellowship with. So he's saying that you must be in a divine relationship with the person, a partnership with the person of the Holy Spirit. 
I'll even say it like this. It is your fellowship with the Holy Spirit that allows you to experience the love of God and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you may come from a, a background where you say the Holy Spirit's operation no longer exists. Or you may come from a background where you've seen excesses on the person of the Holy Spirit. And it was demonstrated to you in a very unappealing way. I'll just say both of those extremes are wrong. And don't let that keep you from the third part of the Godhead. Because you were saved when the Holy Spirit entered you. And you are being transformed into the character of Christ by the person of the Holy Spirit. So I just encourage you, two-thirds is not enough. You need that other part of the Holy Spirit. It was Jesus in John 14. I, I look at John 14, 15 as Jesus talking crazy. I think the disciples, after Jesus was teaching these chapters, was like, man, I don't know what's up with Jesus. He's talking funny around us. He says, listen, it is better that I leave because I'm going to send another one. I'm going to send another to you. And this is what it says in John 14, 16. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, helper, comforter, counselor, depending on your translation, to help you and to be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it either sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. So Jesus is setting up his departure and he says to the disciples, now you don't need to worry about this. I'm going to leave. I'm going to talk to the Father. He's going to send you something. He's going to send you this helper, this advocate, the person, the Holy Spirit. And he chooses a word. I'll be honest with you, that word another there means equal to, not substandard, but equal to me. And he, the words he uses is parakaleos, parakletos. It's two words put together. Para, kaleo, para, meaning very close. And kaleo mean to beckon or to call. You ever had to kaleo your kids? Hey, you better get over here right now. Kaleo you. The Holy Spirit has been beckoned, summoned, called. Para, to be with you. He says here in the text, he will be in you and he will be with you. He is the divine helper who is always called to be alongside of you. The Greek language is pictorial. There's no word without a picture. Uh, paraclete was a, in some circles was a military word. See, the Rome and soldiers had no... Um, had no armor for their backs because they never turned their back on the enemy, only face forward. And so what a rich Roman soldier could do is hire a servant who would always stand beside him in the, in the, in the battle before, during, and after. And they would pay that person to always watch their back. And if the enemy somehow got behind them, then that servant would fight at their back, back to back. You know what that person was called? The paraclete. The one who's called to be alongside. You know when you will understand and know the person and ministry of the Holy Spirit? When you get yourself in a mess. When you feel like the enemy surrounded you, then you will know that the Holy Spirit is standing with you. He ain't gone anywhere. He ain't left you. He's standing in, he's in you and standing right beside you. you know, I'm, I'm going to turn my signals on early. I'm going to turn my blinker lights on early here. In times past, I've spent a lot of time talking about the titles of the Holy Spirit. In fact, I would encourage you to go online on our website. There's a series we did called Come Holy Spirit where we talk about the seven titles, functions of the Holy Spirit operating in the life of Jesus we did one called Roots and Wings several years ago where we deeply theologized the person of the Holy Spirit. But in this series, it's going to be different. We're going to look at a few things. We're going to look at the gifts of the Spirit. The Apostle Paul gives us in 1 Corinthians. We're going to talk about a prayer language, spiritual language. 
We're going to be talking about those things. And then we're also going to be looking at them because sometimes it's hard for us to understand a spirit. It's invisible. How do you, how do you interact with the person of the Holy Spirit? The Bible gives us five metaphors, five symbols to help describe to us his personhood. We're going to be looking at them as well. Here, they're going to list them on the screen. It's wind, water, oil, a dove, and fire. Those are the five symbols of the Holy Spirit. And I would just encourage you, come the whole five to six weeks. Don't judge this sermon or the person of the Holy Spirit on its own. See it as a collective whole. And you may decide, hey, this isn't the place for me after that. That's fine. But we are going to highlight the person, specifically the ministries of the Holy Spirit during this series. There's wind, there's water, there's oil, there's dove, and there's fire. So what I want to do today is I want to begin this journey, and I want to start with the first symbol that I have listed there, and I want to talk about the wind of God, the wind of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 13, it says, uh, this is the church in Antioch, the the center of Christianity has shifted to a multi-ethnic church in Antioch, and the leaders are gathered together to pray. This is uh, our mission at Stone Creek comes out of these few verses. Verse 2, it says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, so they've gathered together to worship and pray and fast. It says, the Holy Spirit said, set apart Barnabas and Saul for the work which I've called them. A phrase jumps out every time, the Holy Spirit said. The word that they use there is the word pneuma, and it means the breath or the wind of God. The Old Testament word was rauk, The New Testament word is pneuma, and it means the breath or the wind of God. As they were worshiping, as they were praying, as they were fasting, God breathed upon the prayer meeting. The wind of the Spirit came into that prayer meeting, and here's what it said. The Holy Spirit said, can I just do some good pastoral teaching here? When the Holy Spirit comes, He comes to lead, not to follow. When the Holy Spirit comes... He comes to lead your life, not to follow your life. The Holy Spirit does not want to um, anoint your plans. You decide and say, come Holy Spirit, help me out. You know that's the wrong brother. You know that's the wrong sister. Holy Spirit, help me out. No, 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 no. Ask the Holy Spirit if that's the one. Ask the Holy Spirit if that's what you're supposed to be doing. The Holy Spirit always comes to lead. He never comes to follow you. Well, Pastor Rick, you're preaching so good right now. I lost, I, I lost some of you. I know I lost some of you at Taco Bell and Kentucky Fried Chicken. You ain't never coming back. I mean, I'm just trying to give you language. I'm trying to give you a biblical perspective on this. Pastor, the Apostle Paul who is the Bible's most prolific writer on the person of the Holy Spirit. He's a practical theologian. He's taking theological concepts and the mysteries of Christ and the Holy Spirit and tries in practical terms to help us relate to to how this is playing out in our life. He says this in Ephesians 5, do not get drunk on wine. Now some of you just need to highlight that verse right there. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm going to let that simmer a little bit. Put that on the grill. Let it just sit. (laughs) Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, but instead be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. You know, the devil always has a counterfeit. For everything that God does, the devil always has a counterfeit. Have you ever bought a knockoff version of a Gucci bag or... A Nike pair of shoes. I hit too close to home there, didn't I? Yeah. You went somewhere and you, you bought that thing. It's got, it looks right. It's got the symbols. But let a little pressure come. Those threads start falling out and boom. It looks like it, but it's not the real thing. Paul's making a comparison. Don't get drunk, but rather be filled. You know, when you come under the influence of alcohol, you'll say things. You'll do some things. 
that you wouldn't normally do on your own. It'll change you for a moment. But let the effects of that, the influence of that wear off. And you're going all the way back to who you were, you were before. But when the Holy Spirit comes, the word there, be filled, means to come under the influence or the control of. It's doing a comparison. Just like the intoxication of alcohol can influence you and change you, but it can't change your nature. But the Holy Spirit, when he comes upon you, he not, can just trans- he can not, not only transform you in a moment, he can transform you for a lifetime. And that's why Paul, when he says be filled, it's a, it's a, it is a continual word. Be filled in the moment, but be filled again, and be filled again, and be filled again. Take every opportunity you can find in your life to tap into the person of the Holy Spirit and come under his divine influence. I told you before that the Greek language is a pictorial language. And the picture of this word to be filled is one of a boat, a sailboat, out in open water. And you have the mast that's going up, and the sail is being opened, and they're waiting for the wind now to come and to fill that sail so that that boat can begin to move across the waters. That's the picture. Be filled. Put your sails up to capture the wind of the Spirit. Jesus compares the Holy Spirit in John to the, whole, to the wind. He says, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone who was born of the Spirit. So it is with everyone who was born of the Spirit. The wind blows wherever it pleases. The title of this message is Chase the Goose, Not the Rabbit. In Florida, decades ago, there was a popular sport called greyhound racing. It has since uh, been um, illegal. But when it was in Florida, you've seen these greyhounds, 10 or so of them, 40 to 50 miles an hour around a dirt track, chasing a mechanical rabbit who was moving just a few miles per hour faster on the inside of the track. And those greyhounds would run full out to catch that rabbit and to chase it. But one day something happened. After the first turn, those dogs are full sprint. The rabbit blew up. The mechanical rabbit catches on fire and blows up. Pieces of the rabbit are everywhere. Some of the dogs grabbed up the debris and just shook the rabbit. Two or three jumped over the fence and just took off running out to nowhere. Some of them started to fight with one another. Some just laid down, and some just stood out in the middle of the track and and just bark. Something's not right here. But not one of those dogs finished. And I just thought about that illustration. How many of you have ever chased a rabbit in your life only to catch it and have it blow up on you? Or chased it and it's not what you thought it was? You could spend a lifetime chasing rabbits a relationship, you knew, I mean, it's, just, it's going to solve all your problems only to have it blow up. You chase that money, you chase that job, you chase that experience, and you get it, and all of a sudden, you're going full sprint towards it, and boom, it blows up on you. There's a different way to live life. The ancient Celts had an interesting way to describe the person of the Holy Spirit. It kind of leans into this, the wind blows where it blows. They, they saw the Holy Spirit as untamable, mysterious. You never know what the Holy Spirit was going to do. And in their language, they only had one word that really described it. They called it the angetagloss, or they called it the wild goose. The Holy Spirit, they said, is the wild goose. And if you partner with him and you chase him and pursue him, You just have no idea where he's going to take you, what he's going to show you, and what he's going to do through you. I think life will take on new meaning for me and you and our church if we'll stop chasing rabbits and we'll chase the goose. 
How do you chase the goose? I'm glad you asked. Thank you for asking that question. <laughs> this is where I'm going to get really practical with you. Number one is um, you have to make significant time to wait on the Holy Spirit. When Jesus leaves, he tells the disciples, don't do anything until you're clothed with power, until you receive the promise of the Father. I just want to encourage you, if you want to see an increase of impossible things, you want to see the wind of God, the breath of God begin to blow into your life, into your situations, it's going to require waiting on the person of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to make this easy for you. Our services are built around the three things of Jesus, the three ingredients, inspiration, instruction, and impossible. We start with inspira inspirational worship. I want to get you moving. Inspirational worship. Then we have a time with instructional part of the word. You got 20 minutes at the 20, 30 minutes at the beginning, 20 or 30 minutes in the word. But you know what we do every week at the end? We leave room for you to experience the person of the Holy Spirit so that he can do impossible things. Can I challenge you? Can I just nudge you and be a pastor for a moment? Some of you, the moment that the service is over, just run out the doors. You have heard the word. You have worshiped him. And the moment where it comes for you to be with the Lord, some of you, this is all you have all week long. This is your devotional life. Some of you, you're in this atmosphere. And I don't know why, but you run out. Listen, your kids are well taken care of. I want to encourage you for this series. Why don't you stay and wait on the Lord? Come let somebody pray for you. Come kneel around the altar. Sit and just worship a little bit longer. This is what your marriage needs. This is how you're going to get set free. This is how God's going to begin to blow into your life in a new way. If you'll just, I'm telling you, just 10, 15 minutes waiting on the Lord to see what he'll do. We're carving out some space in our church calendar in this series on October the 30th. A friend of mine by the name of Sean Smith, who's given his life traveling the world and to really focus on the person and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He'll be with us that morning on October the 30th. And that night, from 6.30 to 8.30, two hours on that night, we have no agenda. We're just going to worship and wait on the person of the Holy Spirit. I want to encourage you, put that down. We have ch children's ministry that night. You can come stay half an hour. You can stay an hour. You can stay whole two hours. I don't care. We are going to make time for us to experience the person of the Holy Spirit. If you need healing, come on that day. If you want baptized in the Holy Spirit, come on that day. If you want to hear from the Holy Spirit like never before, come on that day. We're preceding that with 10 days of prayer and fasting, asking the Lord to pour out His Spirit in a great way on that night. I would encourage you, let's wait on the Lord. Second, increase your knowledge of the Holy Spirit. Biblical knowledge, start reading and praying scriptures about the Holy Spirit. Can I be honest with you? There are no prohibitions given to us in scripture that prevent us from praying to any person of the Godhead. You can pray to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Increase your biblical knowledge of him. Start taking these scriptures and praying them back to the Lord that I'm giving you every week. And now I'll say a second one increase your theological knowledge. We have already pre-picked several books from all different authors around the world, different perspectives. We vetted them. These are really good books that are in the lobby to resource you over these next few weeks. And um, we, all kinds of different perspectives. We'd love for you just to start reading about the person of the Holy Spirit. Sean's book, who's going to be with us, is out there as well. And there are suggested donations for each one. We're not making money off of these. We're losing money. And if you can't afford it, we'll donate it to you. So we would love for you to start reading about the person of the Holy Spirit. And then lastly is this. Obey him. When the, when the breath of God, the wind of God comes into your life, listen. He came, comes to lead. Obey what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. That's how you chase the goose. So what I'd like to do, let's go ahead and start making this sermon practical in our life. I want you all to stand.
as we get ready to close, I'm going to ask the worship team to come. And again, I don't want to make anybody, I understand there's reasons why maybe games and work, why you may have to leave. There's no judgment here. I'm just being a pastor and nudging you maybe to do something different. As you stand, I want you just to bow your heads, close your eyes. And I want you to, I want you to put your hands out in front of you, palms up, as a sign of your humility. And I want you to think with me for a second. I want you to see in your mind right now, you're a boat. And you're resting upon the waters. It's calm waters. There's no wind. I want you to see in that boat, there's a a huge mast, a pole going right up the center of it. And right here at the beginning of this series, what you're doing is you're just pulling that rope down now. And as you're pulling that rope down, the sail is going up that mast. And you're beginning to see that that cloth, that sail, begin to ripple in the wind. You can see it's the beginnings of the wind hitting it. And then all of a sudden, the wind fills that sail. It goes all, blows it all the way out. The boat's beginning to lunge, and it's beginning to move. Something that you could not do on your own. The wind is moving that great great vessel just want you as you are in a place of humility I want us to begin to pray to the person of the Holy Spirit now listen some of you have been lifelong Christ followers you've had an experience with the person of the Holy Spirit years or decades ago but you've neglected that I just believe in this series the Lord's going to send a fresh wind and fill your sails You may be here in this room right now and you're spiritually dead. You've never given your life to Christ. And today the wind of the Lord is going to blow into your life to save you and to set you free. You may feel here that you're in an impossible situation. It's it's unable to be moved. I'm praying and believing a God of impossibilities that you're now the wind of the Lord, the breath of God. As you wait on him, is going to blow into you and upon you and move what has been immovable. I want you to begin to pray that scripture with me. Apostle Paul, let's borrow his words. Would you begin to pray it? Just begin to say, Holy Spirit, fill me. Fill me, Holy Spirit. Breathe upon me, Holy Spirit. Would you tell the Holy Spirit that you want Him to lead you? Come on, tell Him you want Him to lead you. I surrender to you, fresh and anew, Holy Spirit. Come on. When it comes to the paraclete, ask Him to be your helper, your paraclete. So many times I've prayed, God, make me aware that you're with me. Any area in your life where you see a gap, where you need help. Maybe it's a life-controlling sin. Maybe it's a situation beyond your expertise, your knowledge. Come on. Say, Holy Spirit, help me. Come on, humble yourself and just say, Holy Spirit, help me. Help me to love. Help me to forgive. Help me to be set free. Help me to be healed. Help me to make this decision. Come on. All across this room. Holy Spirit, help me to write that book. Holy Spirit, help me to to do this. I need you. Help me to have a hunger for the word. Help me to pray again. God, send a wind. Send a wind. Lord, I pray this morning, send a wind of salvation. Let people be saved all in this room as they surrender their lives to you. Lord, send a wind upon this place over the next few weeks. A divine wind from heaven. Lord, we want inspiring services. We want instruction from the word. But we don't want to leave out impossible. We're going to chase the goose. 
Holy Spirit, come. Fill this place. In Jesus' name, amen.